All right, we're going to finish up Unit 2 by talking about safety. How many of you have gotten hooked by a fish hook? Ouch. I honestly can say I don't think I've ever been seriously hooked. I mean, I've gotten stuck, you know, things like that. But, I mean, something that's really serious, like we're seeing in this image right now, uh, blood, you know, gushing all over the place. Um, I, I've been really fortunate uh, at, at that. There's horror stories. Uh, you guys leave comments. This can be a, a, a very serious issue. In fact, do you know that fishing is the number one cause of sports-related eye injury in the U.S. right now. It used to be basketball, but fishing has actually um, uh, surpassed that a few years ago. I had one young lady, she was a nursing candidate, did a fishing report on fish hook injuries. And as part of her uh, interview, she interviewed a a doctor back in her hometown. Uh, she came from a, a f fishing community. And she included graphics. I probably should have put some limitation on that. But, oh my gosh, it was bizarre. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. What I'd like to is ways of not getting hooked. So let's start with the prevention and then we'll move to, to the treatment. Uh, what you wear, really important. I think every fisherman should wear a hat and I think you should wear glasses. Uh, it could be sunglasses, I have to wear glasses anyway, usually when I fish, especially whenever I'm tying something on to the end of the line. But, but glasses really help protect the eyes. A hat protects the head and the eyes. Even a baseball cap, you know, we just have the, the, the bill out front, but that really can protect the face and, and the eyes. Discipline in establishing casting lanes. If you're out with a group of people, don't be standing side by side whipping a rod back and forth. If you take children fishing, this is incredibly important. If you have two kids, I recommend one on the right of you, one on the left of you, and you in the middle. By the way, if you're taking kids fishing, I recommend that you don't fish until they get older and, and very well established and they can handle everything on their own. Otherwise, you're trying to fish, they need help, you get frustrated, they feel that frustration, they get frustrated, and nobody has a real good time. Anyway, uh, if you're in a boat, uh, you have to establish boundaries. The person in the bow cannot cast after the midline of the boat and, and vice versa for the person in the, uh, in the stern. Um, I fish from a, a canoe often and the basic rule of thumb is one person fishes at a time. And not always, you know, especially if you're bobber fishing with, with live bait. But any type of casting, especially fly fishing, you just have to be really, really, really careful uh, where that back cast is going. Okay, so how are we actually getting hooked? For one easy way is just kind of carelessness. Um, if you've put that rod into horizontal position, which I warned you about uh, uh, last lesson, there's a chance that you can step on it. And if you're in your bare feet or if you're wearing sandals, I mean, how else do you hook yourself in the toe, really? Um, so, so, so be very careful with, 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 with placement. Just handling the lures when they're coming in, a, in the vehicle and out of the vehicle. Uh, a lot of people will leave a lure clipped on. I certainly do. And you're, you're just grabbing the rod. You're pulling it out. And ow, you just grabbed onto the hook. And, and so just be re really careful there. I, I think the probably the, the more serious cases of um, hooking yourself uh, come from getting a lure stuck. You're out fishing, and you snag on something, and you start tugging 
this way and that way, trying to get that lore um, uh, unstuck. And most people would do this by just you know rearing back on the rod as if they're setting the hook and you're putting that great big bend in the rod you're, you're loading all that kinetic energy into the rod and or potential energy and if that lure does come loose or more likely in my case the knot breaks that line's coming straight back at you. And if that lure breaks loose, there's, there's, there's like this, this fourth dimension of Newton's law that, that says that when a snagged lure breaks loose, it will travel in a direct line from the snag to your face. It, it doesn't go arcing over top of you or to the side. It comes straight at your face, and you end up eating that lure. Th that's how people get hooked in the lip. I mean, how else do you get hooked in the lip? And there's a very easy way of preventing that from happen happening, and it's called a straight line pull. Uh, let's take a look at this. What's up, everybody? You stuck in the rocks? That's the easiest one to get your lure out of. Point your rod at the snag, hold the line with your finger, and open your bail. Now, pull the rod back like you're loading the bow, and ping, let your finger go. That quick jolt of slack line should be enough to pop your lure off of that rock. But what if you're stuck in a tree? Step one, find yourself a wire coat hanger. Step two, untwist it and straighten it out. Step three, make a circle on one end and keep it handy on the boat. Step four, when you get stuck in the tree, at the other end of the coat hanger around a boat paddle, net, or boat hook, and you've got an instant, long-reaching de-hooker. But what if you're snagged in wood? The nastiest snag of them all. Always carry a few different size weights and a dual lock snap. Clip on the weight, tighten up on the rod, and let her fly. If the fish gods are on your side, the weight should pop your favorite lure right out of that stump. If you're not hanging up, you're not fishing. This stuff really works. Use that straight line pull. I mean, yeah, you might end up sacrificing uh, a lure, um, but it's just so much more s safe than, than trying to, to load up that rod and, and have that thing uh, come right back at you. Let's say things didn't go real well and you ended up with a lure in the face. What are you going to do now? You have basically three options here. Uh, number one, you can seek professional medical attention. An emergency room, uh, prompt care, uh, something like that. Absolutely no shame in doing this. Don't even consider that for a moment. There's another method called the string trick. And there's another method called clipping the barb. And, well, instead of me trying to explain this to you, why don't you take a look at this video? Hey, I'm Clay Louder uh, with Colonial Family Practice. It's summertime here in South Carolina, and we are seeing a lot of summertime injuries. One of the main ones that we see is a fish hook injury. And uh, I have an unusual way that I like to treat that, uh, and I wanted to show it to you today. Now there are three ways to remove a fish hook. One way is to go to the doctor, get some local anesthetic put into it, and get the hook removed that way. The second way is the pull through method where you take the hook and you actually push it through, cut off the barb with something heavy, and then remove the fish hook. Both those to me are boring. The best way to take a fish hook out that I think is called the string jerk method. My um, I didn't learn this in medical school or in residency, but I learned it from my uncle Steve Louder, who's a professional fisherman. And so I'd like to show you today the way that I jerk a hook out. Now, first thing you need to understand is fish hook physiology. This is a Gamagatsu chemically sharpened fish hook. And right here you can see the barb on the hook. The barb is what catches the fish and holds him to your hook. Well, unfortunately, when that goes into human skin, the barb catches and won't come out and to get it out you have to release that barb so the number one thing you need to remember about that is how to release the barb on this fish hook 
Now what I have here is Mr. Pig, and he unfortunately stepped on a fish hook, probably out in the boat shed, and he's got it hooked into him, and we're going to try to jerk it out of him, and um, we didn't give him any anesthetic at all, or, uh, so he's going to try to tough it out. As you can see, he's got a big worm hook in him, and it's stuck past the barb and stuck pretty good. Now what I've done is I've taken some braided line, and I've doubled it up, and so I've made it into a strong connection, and I'm going to put that over the fish hook and I'm going to jerk it out. Now I'm not going to pull it and I'm not going to ease it out. And what I'm going to do, the most critical part is to use my left hand to put pressure on the hook to release the barb so that I can jerk it out. And it kind of goes like this here. So you take the line, wrap it around the hook. Hopefully the patient hasn't cut the hook too much so you can get to it. Then I push down firm with my left thumb I usually like to count to three and jerk on two so the patient doesn't know I'm getting ready to do it because they'll be tense. Sometimes you have to give them local anesthesia like with a Coors Light or something. If they, if they do that, it usually calms them down. But the first thing I do is just count to three. One, two, boom. Fish hook pops out. You have a happy patient and he is uh, good to go for the next round of fishing. So that's been Clay Louder with uh, my fish hook removal. Hope you have a great summer. Okay, there you go. Um, again, three different methods of dehooking yourself. Um, I've personally kind of like the string trick. Um, I have used it a couple times on other people, and it, it, it does work. Um, one last thing I want to mention is getting a hook in the eye. This is something that absolutely 100% requires professional medical attention. Don't even think about doing anything yourself. It's really important how you treat this injury. As soon as you get that hook in the eye, ugh, God, that's just creepy even just saying that. You have to take immediate action by immobilizing that hook and that eye. You don't want a person walking around with a four-inch Rapala treble hook stuck in the guy's eyeball and he or she looking all over the place. I mean, that's just... Oh, that's freaky. Um, you, you, you have to immobilize the eye. You, you have to, a, a gauze bandage, a clean rag, paper towel, something like that, and, and gently, gently place that over the eye. Now, since we have stereo optic vision, we have two eyes, and they both move in tandem with each other, usually, what we do to one eye, we have to do to the other eye. So you need to immobilize the eye that doesn't have the hook sticking out of it also. You don't want that hook flopping around in a person's eye. So you, you literally have to blindfold them in, in some way. You want to limit movement absolutely as much as possible. Get them to emergency room. They can take care of it there safely. Um, I've heard good results, you know, from that. I've, I've, it's, it's rare, rare to have someone lose their sight, you know, from a fish hook in the in the eye. But it has to be treated properly uh, by medical professionals. Now, here's the one, one kind of caveat. Um, you are into uh, uh, back country canoeing. Uh, you've taken a canoe trip up into Boundary Waters in Minnesota, maybe crossed over into Quetico uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Canada. You're 25 miles back in and somebody takes a fish hook in the eye. You've got a real problem there. You, you're going to have to get that person out uh, this is a real good time to have some type of emer emergency communication 
uh, uh, pr procedures set up. Um, perhaps a person can be airlifted out of there. Uh, perhaps some rangers can come and, and assist you. Uh, but this is a real medical emergency. Uh, if you are doing this by yourself, I can't overemphasize the importance of prevention. Okay, so enough about uh, fish hooks. Uh, one more thing we need to talk about whenever it comes to, uh, to safety um, for Unit 1, and that is lightning. Uh, 2018, we lost 27 people due to lightning strike. Um, that number is actually coming down over the years. Either people are not doing as much outdoors or people are getting a little more smart about lightning. Golfers for years and years were the number one target of um, uh, lightning fatalities. Jeez, wonder why. But this is not this is not really a rare event. In your lifetime, you have a, a one in fifteen thousands chance of being struck by lightning uh, over an eighty year lifespan. Uh, one in fifteen hundred chance of knowing somebody who has been struck by lightning. So if you think of a class of this size, uh, what, about 28 people, uh, one in 1,530 probability, would somebody like to do the math? So it, it's not, uh, th this is not uncommon, and you need to pay attention to it. And if you consider that these numbers are, are kind of generalized, if you are out in the middle of a lake, a big lake, and a thunderstorm is rolling in and you are using a graphite um, rod, run the numbers. What do you think your, 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 your chances are here? So uh, pay attention to this. The, there, there, there's old sayings, uh, when thunder roars, go indoors. If you can hear it, clear it. If you can see it, flee it. All very, very good advice. Anyone who's worked in, in waterfront, uh, like summer camp situations, there's very strict protocol uh, what to do in thunder. Literally, if you can hear thunder, you are close enough to be struck by thunder. And thunder is just a, God, it's, it's just this weird thing. Just when we, we think we start to understand it and can kind of predict it, it changes or we learn something else, or we expect it to do this thing, and it does something totally different, totally bizarre. Um, so how, how do you clear it? How do you flee it? Uh, one of the safest places is to be in a substantial building. What do I mean by a substantial building? Anything that has electricity. So your, your homes, your dorms, your, your apartments, you know, that has electricity, uh, and so that's relatively safe from lightning strike. A, a picnic shelter out at uh, Yellowwood State Forest, um, not so much because there's no electricity in that particular picnic shelter. Why is that important? Because our electrical system Whenever you, you, you plug your computer into the, the, the wall outlet, that outlet is grounded. And what that means is there is literally a copper rod, a half inch in diameter, like eight feet long, that is driven into the earth, into the ground. And that electrical recept is wired to that rod through the... The, the, the main panel. And so if the house does take a lightning strike, one thing we are reasonably confident in is that lightning seeks the path of least resistance. And so it, 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 it finds the, all these copper wires in the house and it finds the green ground wire and it follows it straight into the earth where it's, it's, it's dissipated. The picnic shelter that doesn't have a ground, it gets hit, and the lightning is just kind of bouncing all over the place looking for some place to go, 
everything is fairly resistive and you're standing in the middle of it and you're kind of inside this 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 lightning cage so to speak and and people have been been seriously uh, uh, hurt with that um a vehicle is a good place to be during a lightning storm <clears throat> you have rubber tires and that creates a, 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 a an insulation a a point of very high resistance that if your car should happen to take a strike um, you're probably buying a new car because it's going to fry the electrical system but chances are you're going to be <clears throat> pretty okay maybe in need of counseling um, I had one student wrote her re um, I think it was a she, wrote her report, she was a um, physics major, on how the tires aren't actually the thing that protects you in the car during the lightning strike, and she kind of lost me after the fourth or fifth paragraph. But anyway, um, so what if you're out in the middle of... of, of um, the wilderness, the, the, the lake shore, and there's no car to get to quickly. There's no substantial building nearby. What do you do? Um, if, if you're out on the lake and you see this, this thunderstorm uh, coming in, you need to get to shore. You need to get off the water. Now, some people have made the mistake of, uh, you know, beaching their boat, tying it up, and, and sitting under a, a nice tree and watching the, the storm go, go by. Not the best idea, because if you think about this lake, very flat, devoid of any, you know, tall structures, and then the lake gets to the shoreline, and in our area, there's tall trees. Guess what the lightning's going to target? Exactly. That tree that you're sitting under. Sure, the tree's going to take the hit, but there's this other thing called ground effect lightning. And what happens is that that, that lightning, that energy travels down the tree and then radiates out from the base of the tree. Several yards. And you can actually get barbecued sitting on the ground near a tree that has taken a lightning strike. So, yeah, this is kind of freaky stuff. Um, the, the best thing to do in that situation is to get away from the shoreline. Get up into the woods, um, you know, several, several yards, 100 yards, away from that shoreline so that... If there is a lightning strike, it's more likely that it's going to hit the, 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 the shoreline instead of deep into the forest. Uh, I would avoid uh, hills, you know, climbing up a hill, maybe staying into in, in, in a hollow. Um, don't congregate around targets, basically, this is, is what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> Okay, you're out backpacking someplace, going from one lake to another, and it's bare, flat ground everywhere. There's no real trees around, and a storm's coming through. Oh, crap. Yeah. Um, the, the, the experts recommend uh, going into what's called a crouch position, and literally you're squatting down, making yourself as small as possible, uh, balancing on the balls of your feet. Most people are wearing um, a footwear that has some type of a rubber sole, so that, that, that does provide a, a little bit of a, a in, insulation um, uh, uh, quality, but you want to limit your, your profile. Why don't you just lie down in a ditch someplace? Yeah, you can do that, but there's been cases where people have done that and a lightning has hit nearby and that ground effect lightning now has all that surface area of your body in contact with the ground and 
there's been very poor results uh, from that. So, so limiting your contact with the ground um, is really important, while at the same time making yourself as small as possible. Uh, mountain climbers are probably the most at risk for these type of lightning strikes because they're, they're, they're literally exposed on the side of a mountain and there's no place to go. Well, couldn't you get under a, a, a ledge or a, a, a crevice or um, a cave or something like that? Yeah, but at the same time, remember that if that mountain takes a lightning strike, there's ground effect lightning that is traveling everywhere. And if you're inside of a cave, again, you're kind of inside this microwave oven and it, it, it may not uh, work out very well for you. Uh, so, uh, those are some things to think about, uh, lightning, um, you know, 27 deaths a year. I think we lose more people to bee stings than that. Um, but, um, just, just pay attention to it. Don't, don't tempt, uh, uh, fate. So with that, with that, I thank you for your attention, uh, in unit one, and we will be moving on to unit two.